Hello, future eighth graders. This is your second video on second and third John. I don't know how your summers are going so far. Mine is going pretty well so far in these early days. I discovered this new show on Netflix that some people have been talking about called Avatar. It's really dumb in the first season and then it gets really good in seasons two and three. Kind of into it now. I got some Avatar jokes for you requested by Jaylene, who's secretly a really big fan of Avatar. So she asked me to make some Avatar jokes. I was like, all right, I guess so. Uh, what do you call a mad Avatar? Angry. Uh, what is the Avatar's favorite sport? Sucker. Oh, man. <laughs> what do you call the out? What would you call the avatar if he was born in the 1950s? Boomerang. <laughs> it's so good. Oh, man. <clears throat> uh, um. You know what, that's it. I'll save the rest for my next video. That was a good good sampling for now. All right, we're gonna talk about Second John right now. Second John, uh, remember, is probably written to be the first draft of First John. It's very similar to First John. It's just a lot shorter and a lot more simple. Uh, just like in First John and Second John, the author attacks the false teachers. Um, who were the false teachers? These are the Serinthians. Remember, Serinthians are a type of Gnostic who believe that Jesus and Christ were separate, except for when uh, uh, Jesus and Christ were united at Christ's baptism, and then they stayed together for three years, and then they separated again at Jesus' death. Right? Um, it's not what Christians believe. Christians reject Serenthianism, just like we reject all forms of Gnosticism. Second John, just like First John, makes this clear. All right, so uh, how does he start it out? He says, the elder to the elect lady and her children, grace, mercy, and peace be with us from God the Father and from Jesus Christ, the Father's Son. So remember, in Second John, you're not going to see anything new meaning you're not going to see anything that isn't in 1 John. The reason we study 2 John is, well, first off, because it is part of the canon of Scripture. It's the inspired Word of God. Uh, but secondly, we study 2 John because it gives us insight into uh, kind of how the early church worked, and it is a good supplement for the, for, for the teachings of 1 John. All right, so it's like a combination of a useful historical resource and also another way to approach the teachings of First John. So it's the same teachings, just in a different style. All right, so who is the elder? Remember, in First John, John identifies himself by name, but in Second John, John refers to himself as the elder. And he doesn't call himself an elder, he calls himself the elder, right? It's kind of like if I were to write an email to you guys and instead of signing it Mr. Bruce I would sign it something like uh, the swag one or the hilarious one or the incredible at everything one right all of you would instantly know who that is me right and so John is kind of doing the same thing. He's not signing his letter John, he's signing it the Elder, which is a title that you would give to someone who has a lot of respect and authority inside of a community. And so for the early Christians, they referred to priests and bishops as elders. Another translation instead of elder would be presbyter. That's where we get the word presbyterate, which is associated with 
uh, clergy, priests and bishops. Right? Uh, so there's lots of elders in the early church community, but John is signing it the elder. So he's like, I am like the, the big boss of all the elders, right? And this is true. Um, other outside of uh, the Pope, and extra points if you know who the second Pope is, but outside of the Pope, uh, John has the ultimate authority in the church at this time because he's the last living apostle, right? So he says, the elder to the elect lady and her children. So who are the elect lady and her children? Well, the elect lady refers to a small church community in Asia Minor. We don't know which church community it was. It was just the direct recipient of the first draft of this letter. Um, and her children uh, would refer to anyone that this letter gets passed on to, right? So all the faithful, uh, but also other ch churches as well. And then John says, from God the Father and from Jesus Christ the Father's Son. So here, right away, John is emphasizing the unity between God the Father and God the Son. And in doing so, he's also emphasizing the unity between Jesus and Christ, right? He says, Jesus Christ. Remember, every time John says Jesus Christ, he is making a proclamation of faith, right? That Jesus is the Christ. They are one in the same. So by saying from God the Father and from Jesus Christ the Father's Son, John is emphasizing that the Father and the Son are unified. And more specifically, because grace, mercy, and peace come from God the Father and God the Son, right? Grace, mercy, and peace don't come from them separately. They come from both God the Father and God the Son together. John is saying that the Father and the Son are consubstantial. This means they are of the same substance, right? So at Mass, when we say the Creed, we say consubstantial with the Father. We mean that the Father and the Son are two separate persons, but one God, right? They are made of the same, they are, they consist of the same substance, right? Uh, in other words, God the Son was not created by God the Father. God the Father did not create the second person of the Trinity. The second person of the Trinity, and the third person of the Trinity, and the first person of the Trinity, the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, all coexist consubstantially eternally. They have no beginning and no end. Right? So the fact that grace, mercy, and peace come from both divine persons, not just the Father, shows they are consubstantial. All right, and now I beg you, lady, not as though I were writing a new commandment, but the one we have had from the beginning, that we love one another. And this is love, that we follow his commandments. This is the commandment, that you follow love. So here we see an echo of what John's talking about in 1 John, right? He's talking about love. What do we call love in the writings of St. John? We call it caritas, right? Remember, caritas is loving God and loving your neighbor out of love for God. And because God is not present physically in bodily form on earth with us, uh, it's difficult to love God as if he were just like walking around on the street, right? So the best thing we can do sometimes is to obey God's commandments and to love our neighbor, who is a creation of God, who's created in the image and likeness of God. So this is how we practice caritas, by obeying his commandments and by loving our neighbor. Right? And then, of course, John also reminds us that this is not a new commandment, right? It's a commandment that we have had from the beginning. That means that it pre-existed uh, the incarnation. It pre-existed Christianity. And caritas, the command to caritas, is something that exists as part of the natural law. It exists in all civilizations because it exists naturally in all human hearts and minds. All human beings know at an instinctual level they are supposed to love one another, right? They're supposed to obey moral laws, laws like don't kill, don't steal or maybe not don't kill, but don't murder, right? Don't steal. Things like that are natural laws. Uh, just like the law to practice caritas, you actually don't need Christianity to 
know that you're supposed to practice caritas. This is why we expect Muslims and Jews and atheists and agnostics and Buddhists and Confucians and everyone to practice caritas, not just Christians. Um, and like I said, this is an echo of what we see in, in 1 John. <clears throat> All right, now he's going to talk about false teachers. Here he doesn't use the word false teacher. He uses the word deceiver. For many deceivers have gone out in the world, men who will not acknowledge the coming of Jesus Christ in the flesh. Such a one is the deceiver and the antichrist. Look to yourselves that you may not lose what you have worked for. Do not receive him into the house or give him any greeting, for he who greets him shares his wicked work. <clears throat> All right. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> so, um, this is a repeat of the warning that he gives against the false teachers, the Corinthians in 1 John. Although here he's not really going after Corinthians specifically. He seems to be going after Gnostics in general. Any deceivers that reject the incarnation. Remember, Gnostics also reject incarnation, not just Corinthians. John says these deceivers are an antichrist. Remember, for John, an antichrist is a sign of the end times because they oppose the church. They're wicked. They work in opposition to the church. That makes them an antichrist and a sign of the end times. John says that during the end times, there will be many antichrists, right? And this is one of them, the Gnostics. Uh, John is being very explicit here, right? He's not mincing his words. He says, these deceivers, these false teachers can cause you to lose what you have worked for. Right? This means if you believe what the Gnostics believe, you will lose your salvation. This is the danger of heresy. Heresy is not just dangerous because it upsets the bishops and the Pope. Heresy is dangerous because it causes people to believe things that are not true. And if you fail to believe the right things, if you believe wrong things, that means you are going to act according to your beliefs. <clears throat> and by doing so, you'll violate the laws of God. We know from John, anytime you violate the laws of God, you fail to practice caritas, commit sin, you lose your salvation. So John is being very clear. If you follow the Gnostics, even if you've been baptized, you can lose your salvation. Right? There's no such thing as guaranteed salvation for the living. Right? You can always lose it. So it's really hard to exaggerate how intense John is being here. Right? He says... This heresy is like a very contagious disease, right? Or it's like the flames of a raging fire, right? Just getting near to it can infect you, can burn you, can cause you to lose your soul. So you should not receive these people. You should not give them any greeting at all, right? You shouldn't go anywhere near them at all, right? Heresies are extremely extremely dangerous stay away that's his message all right one more i hope you to come see you and talk with you face to face so that our joy may be complete the children of your elect sister greet you so this uh conclusion this blessing um <clears throat> ends his letter it also ends third john it's a very similar conclusion to third john so basically what you need to know here is John is being very warm and generous. So he gives this really severe warning. And then he ends with this warm and gentle and generous blessing to show his genuine love for the church. Everything John is doing is out of love for Christ and his church. Right? And then he says, the children of your elect sister greet you. So your elect sister here refers to the church at Ephesus where John's writing from. So he's writing from one church at Ephesus to another. Right? He's writing from the elect sister, his church, to the elect lady, a different church. All right, next video is going to be on 3rd John.